Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Kate Chapman, and I'm the chairperson of the OpenStreetMap Foundation. Um, been involved in OpenStreetMap for the past decade. Uh, when I was asked to give this talk, um, it's a little funny because the award we won yesterday is really for everyone. So trying to think about what to touch on. Um, so I'm really just going to go through some of our major milestones, some background on the project, those sorts of things. Um, my, one of my original ideas was, could I read the names of everyone who contributed data? But it turns out that would take a year, so that won't work. So I'm just going to talk about some of the things we've done. So sometimes I forget this part. I'm a geographer, so I just assume everyone thinks maps are important. But, and, and today it's becoming more obvious because we have so many more uses of maps. You, you know, if you have a smartphone, they're right there on your phone. It's not so much before when you occasionally would use a street map or something like that. But it's still, you know, maps are important and they've been important for a long time. Um, one of my favorite 150-year-old uh, maps, uh, one of the epidemiological maps that was about cholera, so basically, Jon Snow mapped cholera cases in London, and this is how he saw there was a geospatial distribution related to certain water pumps of those cases. Uh, what's this have to do with OpenStreetMap, other than maps are cool and they've been cool for a really long time? Can you imagine if that road data didn't exist? Like, how would he have plotted that? How would he have done that work? Um, and in some places in the world, that's the situation we're at today. So think back, 2004, that's when OpenStreetMap got started. Um, in the UK, the Ordnance Survey, which is the national mapping agency there, their data was very expensive. Uh, University Steve Coast needed map data, very similar to what Jon Snow needed, so he decided to make his own map. And OpenStreetMap was born. Uh, at this time, this is people mostly walking and on bicycles with GPS units. So imagine the hiking GPS units, you know, not so much your phone, which you might use today. You know, everyone wasn't just walking around with a GPS in their pocket. So the vision was to create a free map of the entire world. Um, I, we, you know, in earlier days didn't talk about it as much, but really I believe it should be made by the people making up that world. You know, everyone should be able to contribute to that map. One of my favorite things about how we describe our license is called the cake test. Um, geographic data, or a map, is only open if someone can make you a gift of a cake with your map on it. Um, and so the idea behind this, this isn't so much the free isn't speech, free isn't beer type argument. It's actually, could you take your map to a baker, say, print this map on a cake, take that to a party, cut up the cake for all your friends and share it, and respect the license? The end result of this is we make a lot of map cakes now. <laughs> um, I've eaten OpenStreetMap map cake at the World Bank, at government offices, at little community parties. It's um, one of the unique, quirky things about our community. So at a very high level uh, technical look, what really makes up OpenStreetMap? So we have these things called nodes, ways, and relations. And that's the actual data of where something is on Earth, the XY coordinates, if you will. Um, and so we have that information. And then we have key values attached to it. Um, so you can have a point, and you can add as much information to it as you want. The reason this is unique is normally in geographic information systems, you have layers. So you might have like your hotel layer, your street layer, and it's separate data. Um, picture it almost like separate tables. We just mash it all together. Um, and the reason that's awesome, though, is our um, data schema is actually crowdsourced, not just our data. But you end up with really funny things, like we have a tag, on a, you could have it on a road, horse equals yes, which presumably, are you putting horse equals no on all the roads? So over the years, you know, the structure can be a little funky. So I'm going to go through some major milestones. I'm sure I missed someone. Sorry, there's many milestones. You know, it's been 15 years, and I skipped the first third of them. Um, so 2004, like many good projects, domain name gets registered, 
put up a website, and the first mailing list post. Um, the first community, really community gathering was 30 mappers went to the Isle of Wight in 2006 to map the island and get to know each other. So, you know, OpenStreetMap, a lot of it takes place in the physical world. So, you know, a lot of times we're mapping at home, but we also come together. Um, another important thing that happened in 2006 is the OpenStreetMap Foundation was formed. So, before that, it was really just Steve Coast had like this project and this idea, but as with many projects, you start to need some legal structure behind it. Who's gonna own the servers? Who owns the trademark, the domain name? Those sorts of things. So, the Rails port. What is this? This is our software, also in 2006, that runs the OpenStreetMap website and the API. Um, you should think about names, because they could stick around for a really long time. So, 13 years later, the Rails port has existed longer than the original software. Sorry, you don't have a cool name, Rails port. Um, and same year, the first OpenStreetMap companies were founded, uh, Geofabric and CloudMade. 50% of these companies still provide OpenStreetMap services, and 100% of them are still in business. The one not providing the services is not competing with us or anything either, so just so you know. Um, so Jossum. Jossum is a desktop editor. Um, I think of it as the Swiss army knife of OpenStreetMap. There is nothing you cannot do for open, in OpenStreetMap in Jossum. There's probably a plugin for it, um, but there's a lot of buttons. Um, so this is sort of the power user tool that developed about that time. One of the other uh, real game changers, if you remember back, people were just going around with GPS units, so you actually had to go down every inch of the area you were mapping. Yahoo uh, donated their imagery for digitizing in 2006, so meaning you could have a picture, uh, a satellite picture or an aerial picture, and you could trace over it to create lines, um, to digitize buildings, things like that. So you no longer had to map, walk every inch to map things. Um, and there's some things that maybe would be inaccessible because there was a fence or something, you could still now see them. The first state of the map happened in 2007, and then this map, which it's a little hard to see uh, on this screen, but those are all the other places state of the maps have happened, be they regional, um, international, and people are getting together to talk about OpenStreetMap in a conference format all over the world. Um, as I said yesterday, we'd be nothing without free software. Um, so Mapnik is a library that allows you to render beautiful maps. Um, so that came out around 2007, 2006, and it was one of those things, another mailing list post. People were like, oh, you know, there's always a mailing list post. But this one is successful and drives a lot of the cartography today. Potlatch, Potlatch was our first online editor. Remember I said we had the Swiss army knife of mapping. Potlatch is more for a while, if you went to openstreetmap.org, you didn't just like sign up for an account and edit. It was more complicated than that. This is the first time you could just, in the browser, start editing. Uh, GPS to go, it's, this is a program that we don't really do anymore, and it's because access to GPS is a lot easier. But it was this idea that you could write to the foundation and be sent GPSs in, um, places where they would be more cost prohibitive. So we started sending GPS units around the world. So um, I, I sort of polled my fellow board members to ask about um, you know, those milestones that they thought were really important. And the thing was, this 2009 Gaza mapping, actually, we forgot about it. And the keynote yesterday reminded me, I'm like, wait a minute. We've done mapping in Gaza to try to help, because OpenStreetMap, we help in our own way. So the first time in 2009, um, Mikkel Marin put out a call, let's map, map Gaza. And then later, um, funded by um, and supported by Jumpstart International, sent people to actually learn how to map an OpenStreetMap. Then the community uh, was called on again in 2014 to uh, look at satellite imagery to map damage to buildings in Gaza. So the UN could do an assessment of what level of damage had happened. So for me personally, and a lot of the community, um, 
the terrible earthquake that happened in Haiti in January 2010 was really a changing point for the project. Um, so what happened was there was a huge earthquake and um, people were trying to figure out what they could do. And what I always thought was fascinating is people just started mapping, figuring, just from old imagery, figuring may maybe having a free map would be useful. But they didn't at first talk to each other. So within an hour of each other, an OpenStreetMap mapper in Japan and one in Germany just started mapping. And then eventually, you know, people figured out what they were doing. And over the course of a month, 400 people came together to map Haiti, going from this rather blank map to this detailed map. We were um, imagery uh, post-earthquake was donated for us to use. And eventually, some of us started going there. Uh, in the early days, just a few days after the earthquake, what really, I think, got people going is this picture was posted on our wiki. And it was from one of the search and rescue teams. And he said, having OpenStreetMap on this GPS is vital for us getting around. And, you know, a lot of times you don't even figure that out because, you know, how many search and rescue people are going to take the minute to, like, sign up for a wiki account and then, like, post a picture? Um, but this is one of the real first very clearly documented uses of OpenStreetMap in emergency response. So um, the humanitarian OpenStreetMap team was an idea. Um, talks were given about it starting around 2006, this idea that free map data um, could be useful in humanitarian response. Um, we started going to Haiti in response to the earthquake. Um, I, the first trip happened about six weeks after the earthquake. Um, and then we kept going. Um, originally, it was just to help response, use, re response um, organizations use the data. But later, it was to teach people in the community and teach people in organizations how to actually update the map. Uh, and then, um, in August 2010, someone wanted to give us some money. Uh, prior to that, we were getting a little travel funding like through a fiscal sponsor. But it was really, um, it was really one of those things where we didn't have a big plan. Um, and so we became an organization. We did not put a lot of thought into it. We more were like, we need a bank account to have some money to keep doing good work. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, the next year, the Australian government approached us and said, what if you pre-mapped? So then we started going to Indonesia to build an OpenStreetMap community there. And the humanitarian OpenStreetMap team, or HOT, um, supports humanitarian and international development projects around the world today. Um, and I should mention, um, so this is a separate organization built on OpenStreetMap. Um, and part of the reason um, for going to Indonesia, as I mentioned, was sometimes it can actually be fairly easy to build free software. But if you need data, what do you do? So they were building um, impact modeling software to help disaster managers make better decisions. So they had scientific models. And they couldn't figure out how to get them into the hands of the regular disaster manager. So they'd actually do something to plan. So the idea behind this software is you could have a model of, say, like a volcanic eruption. And you can combine that with infrastructure data, such as buildings, and say, OK, in this scenario, this many buildings will be damaged. So this many people will be displaced. So you need to plan and have this many tents, blankets, rice, all these sort of, th of things to prepare. They didn't have that building information. So that was why we were there doing the pre-mapping was to pow power in a safe, this free software that we were putting in the hands of disaster managers. Uh, the next major milestone, and unfortunately with the humanitarian work, it's, oh, it's always it's, it's tied to something terrible that happens. Um, a local um, Nepalese, uh, organization called Kathmandu Living Labs had been mapping an OpenStreetMap for a few years. Their executive director is the first person to do his PhD in OpenStreetMap, his thesis. You know, they were home. And the earthquake happened. And so the next day, they, they were, you know, outside, because it was the only safe place to be, and beginning to figure out how to update the map, who they could help, in collaboration with the international OpenStreetMap community. The difference here is we had connections to community members on the ground versus Haiti. We were sort of coming in and just trying to see what we could do. So I'm going to shift a little back to sort of more geeky legalese. 
Um, Cause I could give an entire talk on the humanitarian OpenStreetMap team, but that's a small sect, sector of everything that OpenStreetMap does. Um, one of our other major milestones, we've um, always had a copyleft license, but we used to be licensed under a Creative Commons by attribution license, which at the time, it's no longer the case, was not right for data. So there was questions if our data, if our data could actually be free under that license. So we ended up converting to the open database license. And the reason this is an important milestone is it was a, a license change is a huge deal. Um, we had to get everyone to re-agree to the new license and, and we lost some people along the way. Um, and it took some time for the community really to recover. It, but you know, today uh, it put us on better legal footing and um, and we're really the largest project using this license today, but more and more people have begun to use it. Um, so we're around 2012 now in our milestones. Uh, ID is the current default editor if you go to openstreetmap.org and hit edit. And it was really, um, in my opinion, one of our friendliest editors by far. You can sign up for an account, it'll walk you through a tutorial. You really can say to someone, edit an OpenStreetMap, it's easy. Just sign up for an account and get going. Uh, another milestone is, I don't know if you remember this, but Google basically used to offer free uh, API access and people built their entire businesses on it and then they were going to start to charge and certain businesses all of a sudden were going to have multi-million dollar API bills. So people started switching to OpenStreetMap. Um, our data is free, you know, it's not necessarily free to host or go through a provider providing the data, but it was significantly cheaper than what Google was putting in place at that time. So we started to, you know, really pick up, pick up steam at that point, um, which is continued uh, over time as people saw there's a viable option other than Google. Uh, another, uh, so we've had mapathons all over the world, including the White House. So um, one of our you know, more prestigious mapathons um, under the Obama administration, but OpenStreetMap is really beginning to be sort of everywhere. Remember that 2006 uh, donation of imagery from Yahoo? That's not the only place. Now it's, um, we're almost spoiled for choice for imagery in some, some ways. Uh, the State Department provides imagery to us. Uh, Digital Globe and Airbus, who are the two space organizations, commercial ones that own multi-billion dollar satellites. Um, they're the only ones if you want high resolution imagery of the Earth, often donate imagery, uh, Planet, which is um, a microsatellite company, has provided it, the World Bank, governments, many others. Um, so we went from walking around with GPS units to having many choices of different sensors to actually map with. And then there's the uses. So we don't just have map cakes, we have map coloring books. Um, I think one a project can stay with the sort of the zeitgeist of the time and what is popular, um, that's a sign that you've made it, you know? And um, so our data is, op uh, is free and open enough to make a coloring book. Uh, over the time, we ended up with a lot of informal affiliations for OpenStreetMap. Um, but we also have official local chapters. And what it means to be a local chapter is you actually have the rights to use the trademark, um, you're actually, you get a seat on our advisory board and official recognition from the OpenStreetMap Foundation. Uh, 2016 was the first chapters Congress that stayed of the map. We've actually been in, in some ways a little slow at developing these local chapters. Um, but they're officially recognized and we have unofficial local chapters that I'm sure will come on as we go over time. We also have corporate membership. Um, so a lot of organizations use our data. Um, and so corporate membership was a way they could support us. Um, corporate, corporate members, you know, uh, get a seat on our advisory board. 
They're separate from our membership that elects our board of directors, but they have a place within our community. Um, between, you know, everyone from Apple and Microsoft to the individual mapper have a place in OpenStreetMap, just figuring out where we all fit. Another exciting thing that happened last year is we received a quarter million dollars worth of Bitcoin from the Pineapple Fund. What was exciting was it appeared in our, our wallet and someone had to tell us. So that was awesome. Um, so we, we're a, a pretty low budget organization. Our budget is, tends to be is around uh, 70,000 to 100,000 dollars, 1,000 pounds a year. So a quarter million dollars is huge for us because we, we have one part-time staff member and that's it, um, running all this data that all these organizations use. Then there's our growth. Um, so we started, you know, you'll see from this, it's a little bit log logarithmic. I really should have put a graph in place which would have helped. But, you know, going from 1,000 users in 2005 to 5 million registered users today. Um, and the numbers are a little funny. Slightly over a million, people, a million users have contributed data, but 5 million people have signed up for an account. The OpenStreetMap of today, um, it's still a community mapping themselves, but it's grown to be much, much more. Um, like other free projects, we're not without tensions. Um, you know, when you, when you work together for such a lofty goal, uh, I think we all believe in the same thing. We want a free map of the entire world. But the roadmap to get to that free map, you know, we, we don't agree on all the lefts and right hand turns. The OSM of the future. Um, I'd love to see more data available from sensors. And so from sensors, I mean things, anything from like a satellite to a GPS trace from your phone to maybe LIDAR data from self-driving cars to street view to you know, anything that we might be able to use to update that map. There's probably things out there that, that'll come eventually that I haven't thought of or we, no one's thought of. Uh, we really in some, we need to define the place for automated mapping. Um, so since we started as a very manual process and now machine learning has made major strides in how you can extract data from satellite and aerial imagery or even street view imagery, it's figuring out where's that place, you know, where do the humans and where do the robots fit? I would love to see more editors from all over the world. We do skew very white, male, and western. Um, there's a lot of work to get other people involved, but we really don't fully represent the map that we're making. Um, more users, more community, and of course, there'll be more map cakes. So how many of you have ever mapped an open street map? Yeah, pretty good number. Good audience for that. Um, so how do you join us? There's a lot of different ways. Simply start mapping. Go to opusstreetmap.org, get an account, and then map what you know. Um, go to your neighborhood. There's probably something missing, because you can have a virtually unlimited amount of detail. There's probably something important to you that someone else hasn't yet cared about. Can also start coding. Use our data. Contribute to tools to help us improve the data. Um, and there's a million other things you can do with OpenStreetMap. Start organizing. Um, as I said, it's a lot of time home at your computer, but we have mapathons and mappy hours. I don't know if there's ever been a Mapapalooza or a map stock, but there should be. Um, just stick the word map on it. So if you've been participating in OpenStreetMap in for a while, please consider joining the OpenStreetMap Foundation. We're not an expensive membership. 15 pounds for a year gets you a seat at the table. Um, you can, you're on our OpenStreetMap Foundation mailing list. You can vote for our board of directors. You can run for our board. Uh, this is a way to support the organization that supports the community. 
There's a few upcoming events. So if my talk about OpenStreetMap was so exciting, you want to listen to two or three days of it. Um, State of the Map 2019 is in Heidelberg, Germany, the 20th through the 23rd of September. And the US chapter of OpenStreetMap is having State of the Map US 2019 in Minneapolis, Minnesota, the 5th through the 8th of September. Uh, both of these have scholarships available. Um, so if, if this is something you're interested in and you're concerned you may not be able to afford the cost, I encourage you to go check out those opportunities. There's also opportunities to volunteer. So I want to thank the Free Software Foundation. Uh, I wouldn't be here talking to you today um, without the generous um, award that we were awarded yesterday, the Social Benefit Award. As I've said, free maps power free software. Um, it used to be if you wanted to write free software using geospatial data, you would tend to have to get a small subset of proprietary data to be able to do anything. And it you know, did, didn't cover the world, you were building it based on proprietary data, and you didn't have that many options. Now, fortunately, we're able to give you options. And it also goes the other way. Um, people couldn't contribute to OpenStreetMap without using the free software our community has built. And if I haven't stressed it enough, I hope I have, thank you to the OpenStreetMap community. You know, without a million accounts adding information, we wouldn't have a detailed map. Okay, thank you. Um, I definitely have time for some questions. If you have any questions, just make your way up to the microphone. If, you're, uh, if you need a microphone brought to you, just raise your hand and I'll come to you. Thanks so much for uh, letting us know what the OpenStreetMap is up to. I was curious, you mentioned briefly at the end that uh, you were saying like, oh, it kind of skews a little white and Western. Are there places that are like kind of top of the list? like? you know, like, man, we really would like to get to know some folks in X place or something like that? Hmm. That's a good question. Um, you know, you, you could, it's sort of a geeky answer, but you, you could do analysis with population and then look at, like, how much data is supposed to be there. And, and some, er, some individuals and organizations are doing that and trying to focus in those areas. Um, so, it, yeah, it's not like a specific country where it's like, oh, we should go there right now. It's more like how do we have better coverage and support burgeoning communities so they can contribute. Cool, mm -hmm. thanks. Hello. Hi. First of all, thank, thank you for providing open street, street map, especially providing them an SVG, because um, it's very, very useful. Um, I wanted to know if there was um, future plans for improving the, the search capability, especially the address ma ma mapping, since um, looking at the maps, they, they look beautiful but actually doing searches for places, it often falls down. Yeah, well, so, so there's two aspects to that. Um, one is um, we're actually, sometimes in OpenStreetMap we're spoiled for choice. There's the search we provide on our website and then there's other providers. Um, and then the other is data. So we definitely don't have universal address data. So 123 Main Street might not work. Um, and so I would say I can't personally speak to efforts to improve that. Um, I'm sure the developers working on that will incrementally improve it, but I'm not aware of like a specific big initiative to do that. It's, it's very interesting. Uh, I think we were talking, you talked about the disaster uh, mm -hmm. relief team, which I guess is separate, you said, from your main efforts and, and funding. So, uh, so you guys have or sort of a shoestring budget or you did it one time like half an employee uh, so how, how does that get does that the disaster relief team get funded by something like the UN or are they how much you know how much nonprofit funding is there for that kind of work versus fall into your time and so? yeah so it's a combination um, I don't know what the budget is of the humanitarian open street map team now I was their first executive director so I did know at one point but um, it's on the magnitude of over a million dollars a year. It might be two million, somewhere in there. Um, 
and it operates with paid staff, but also a lot of the work is organizing volunteers. Um, so there's, if there's a disaster, helping organize people so they can help update data. Um, also, part, there's, a, there's a partnership called Missing Maps, which I don't know who all the partners are now, but originally it was HOT, um, Doctors Without Borders um, UK, the American and the British Red Cross. And so coming together and saying, okay, these aid and humanitarian agencies are going to specific places. Let's do the amount of remote, as much remote mapping as we can do first before they go on missions places. Yeah, so, so I think this, this also brings up a very interesting point is, so you have this open data license, but there's, uh, you know, you have this need for real-time information, right? And I, I wonder if, you almost need sort of like this infectious sort of GPL style license or if people are using your data and they're combining it, you know, with essential sources of data, if you can somehow make that data also free, right? Yeah, so the ODBL license is a copyleft license. Um, yeah. And so if you, re and there's examples on our wiki about like specific mixing and matching and what it means. Um, so that is in place. Um, and, it sort of depends on what you're doing with it, basically. But so, essentially, like the basis is, if you take OpenStreetMap data and you improve it, and then you share it with someone else, you have to share it with everyone. So very, very GPL-ish. But, but could it be also that if someone's using OpenStreetMap data and they're republishing it and they're adding other data, could, could you stop someone from making that proprietary data? And could you require that they also share that sort of data that's well, being that's served alongside exactly it? Well, that's exactly what I, that's what yeah. I just said. Okay, okay, oh, so it is, it's a requirement, okay. <laughs> yeah, if you're Im improving the OpenStreetMap data, like, you have to release that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi. Hello. Um, I'm interested in uh, versioning of the data and finding out what, it, it sounds like the emphasis is on using the latest data that's available at any given time. But what if someone wants a map that was a month old or a year old or something? Is, is that built into the system? Yeah, so you can definitely do that. Um, basically, we have different types of dumps, and you can you can start at a snapshot and add the daily snaps the diff daily snapshots on to get what to what time you want to be. Um, a lot of that sort of sort of data is used more for sort of social analysis than anything else because. Um, Academic studies have shown if something's mapped in OpenStreetMap, it's highly accurate. It's comparable to commercial and government data. But if there's a blank spot, that doesn't mean necessarily there's a blank spot. So there's only certain uses where like snapshots of data um, from before would necessarily be useful. Um, my uh, question is actually more of a comment, which is something I, I think you didn't touch on in the talk. There's an application it's available in the F-Droid repository called Street Complete. Mm -hmm. And um, that is something that I found that it does let you like sort of passively contribute to the, the that, open. That's true. Um, I, as I said in the milestones, I knew I'd missed something. And Street Complete is definitely uh, sure. one yeah. to use. <laughs> I just thought a great way if you just want to contribute right now. For sure, uh, yeah, like it's a great way. Install that and yeah. <laughs> I appreciate that you've been trying to represent the broad community and the great amount of work that's gone into this, but I'm just wondering if you'd be uh, willing and able to share some of your personal interests in this as a geographer, um, because sure. a, as we heard, right, you do what you love and it's a lot of volunteers and that's, I'm sure, how you got into it, so. Sure, so two things. Um, I started by mapping my neighborhood in Sterling, Virginia. Um, I don't live there anymore, but you could probably tell where my neighborhood is if you took those snapshots of the data and looked for it. Um, but I worked for a proprietary mapping company at the time that basically took government data, like polished it up, and then sold it as a subscription back to the government. Um, and during Hurricane Katrina, 
I maxed out my boss's Amex Black Card, which I guess has a limit, um, buying proprietary data to help find people places to stay with, uh, after Hurricane Katrina. So I feel like I need to spend the rest of my life working on freedom to make up for that. Um, the second part, is, so basically I knew I needed to find a new job when I discovered OpenStreetMap. I'm like, why are we doing this with data? Like, eventually it's going to have no value. I mean, it's valuable, but it's going to be a commodity. Um, so that happened. And then my personal project I was working on is I lived in a relatively nice neighborhood, but the fancier neighborhood next to us had the same playground equipment. They had surveillance cameras up, and it said you had to be a resident to use the playground equipment. So I started secretly mapping their neighborhood and my own, basically to show they looked the same. Um, so my friend and I used to call it spite mapping. <laughs> oh, you rich people, we're going to go map your neighborhood. So that's how I got involved. Um, but then after Haiti, it, like I started going to Haiti after the earthquake, um, and then we, I was one of the found, founders of the humanitarian OpenStreetMap team. Um, and so OpenStreetMap really has personally changed my life. Um, I went from living in the suburbs of Washington, D.C. to living in Indonesia for four years to build an OpenStreetMap community there, um, to you know, traveling all over the world, meeting our communities, and getting people started mapping. So really, as a geographer and an individual, it's been an incredible um, community to be a part of. And I don't really know where I would be without OpenStreetMap. What, what would have happened? Would I still be working for a government contractor in a cubicle? Maybe. Hopefully I would have found something else. Because I definitely at the time knew about free software. So it wasn't like th these ideals were beyond me. But yeah, I, I really feel like I owe a lot to OpenStreetMap and our, and our community because that really enabled me to do what I love and hopefully save my soul from, you know, proprietary data. <laughs> That's great. Thanks for your talk. Um, quick question. Just you mentioned that a lot of the imagery um, data was like donated. I'm just curious, like why those companies are donating it? Or what's yeah, the and, and it's a little complicated because it's, us it's usually usually not released under an open license. Mm -hmm. It's more derivative works from that data is allowed. Mm -hmm. So like OpenStreetMap's open, but the imagery, a lot of times they'll say this can be used for OpenStreetMap. Yeah. Um, I, there was a time where I just used to go to companies begging them for imagery, and maybe they, and I wasn't the only one, so they sort of, I think, got sick of it, and like, oh, the OpenStreetMap people again. But it's, it's generally, except in some disasters, it's generally not an open license, and it's specific to OpenStreetMap. Okay, and it's just like out of the goodness of their heart or that they're annoyed at you asking? Um, OpenStreetMap's useful yeah. to them, too. Yeah, okay. So yeah. It, it's really, we got to the point where we were, like, there's a business case. Like, yeah. some of it is, like, social good, but they're yeah. big corporations, too. So, yeah. you know, they're, they're in it for something, you yeah. know? Yeah, right. Okay. <laughs> Okay, well, thank you everyone for listening to me, and I really appreciate my first Libra planet. I'll have to you know, keep it on the calendar again, um, and thank you. Mm -hmm.